Please welcome Richie Etuaro, Group Vice President, Sejidem. Good morning, everyone. My name is Richie Etuaro, and this is my third time at this conference, and I'm really excited to be here, so thank you for listening. Next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to take you through a condensed form of a journey that I'm going to take on for the next decade. I don't know whether it was uh, financial uh, challenges or parenting style, but my parents didn't believe in uh, fun toys. They believed in books. So around seven, I got what I thought was my first fun toy, a hundred piece puzzle. Huge smile, I was, uh, finally something I can play with. So like every child, you know, I fixed the puzzle over and over and over. And what I'd done is every time I fixed the puzzle, I'd suck the fun out of the puzzle because it gets easier to fix every time. And so my first invention was not an innovation. I invented the, you know, begging for myself. And I begged for a second puzzle. And of course, I got a second one, and I got to the same fate. You know, you get bored over it if you fix it too many times. And so I really started to think about, you know, how am I going to get this third puzzle? Because begging is not working. And my parents said, listen, you're going to have to get fun out of the two puzzles that you have somehow. So I started to innovate. First thing I did was I took the two puzzles, put it in a big bag, shake it together, and then fix them simultaneously. You get a little bit of fun out of that. I eventually started to flip it over, draw my own pictures on the back, you know, try to reassemble them. That was very difficult. But those were just evolutionary innovations, right? Uh, sometime before my eighth birthday, I had done my first revolutionary innovation. South America and Guyana, I had a bicycle and a bag, and I'd set up my first ecosystem. This was not a product, this was an industry. This was not the Airbus, this was the Boeing jetliner. And so a lot of things have happened since then. I did a few successful startups, a few unsuccessful ones, a few successful transformations of large companies, a few unsuccessful ones, and some good investments and some bad investments. And here I am in pharmaceutical, studying the industry, and I landed on the biggest puzzle I've ever landed in my life. Why don't we have a prevention industry. And there's been, you know, there's been, some, uh, there's been some progress there in prevention. There's been, you know, there's buyer demand starting to be signaled. We know that the current model is broken, but why haven't we solved for this really, really big problem of prevention? And technology is not the only solution, you know. Technology promised us really big, um, really big changes and we got Facebook and space travel out of it, right? Um, so, I am going to spend the next decade of my life using this company called the Human API to force the prevention industry into existence. And I'm going to take you through how I'm going to do that. Here's what I mean by a prevention industry. I'll give you a metaphor before we get started. When was the last time you saw a car on the side of the street with the alternator burnt out? Anybody? 20 years ago, did you see that all the time? And the reason is, we don't see that anymore because cars are now censored to be able to tell you what is going to happen to them as opposed to telling you what happened to them after it's happened, right? So we see, you know, the mechanic shop dying. You don't take your car to a mechanic shop anymore. The car tells you you need to go to a service center. And this is essentially cars going from cure-based health to prevention-based health. I mean, there's a whole economy built around it, an entire industry, to the extent that while our cars are smart, our bodies are still dumb. And this is here even though we've seen some progress. Let me walk you through some progress. This is a picture of what it was like for a woman to figure out whether she was pregnant or not in the 1950s. I asked Dr. Janice what that was like, and she said, good girls didn't have to find out. OK? Um, but anyway, you make a call, you go to the doctor, you make an appointment, you sit, you wait, you pee in a cup, send it to a lab. It takes about three weeks to figure out whether you're pregnant or not. And then you have to come home and cook dinner and explain to your husband what happened. Today, we have sold billions of lab-in-a-box inventions with higher precision, higher convenience, and higher cost. So we have all these measurements about ourselves that we use to go to doctor's offices to take, but we're not doing anything with it. This is progress. 
right? It's one step in the right direction of, of the cars, you know, having, having information about themselves. Let's talk about number two. How many people have Fitbits or Jawbones on? Quantified self. We can now listen to our bodies in ways that we never have. Wearable, digestible, implantable, proximity, we're able to convert our body's analog physiology into digital data. Progress is being made. There are not billions of these, but they certainly are hundreds of millions. The third piece of progress that's being made is medical printing. There are millions of these. Dentists are medical printing. Hips are being printed. We're seeing drugs be printed. We start to see cells be printed. And these are not your, um, these are not your MakerBot um, type printers. These are medical printers, yet we're not seeing the type of prevention industry that I am describing. You'd imagine that when all three of these things are moving together, there will be some sort of point of inflection where we would go from a product-based mentality to an industry-based mentality. you think that we would start to put together the rules of engagement for a prevention marketplace where buyers and sellers of prevention product can transact. Right? But no, we're not there. And what's driving today, or what's driving me at least, to take as my next decade's goal, I can't say life goal, which is to articulate and postulate and force the prevention industry into, into a, uh, um, existence, is the fact that for the first time, health data had gone from a design of being a system of record to a design of being a system of engagement. Finally, I get my health information, and it makes me want to do something about it. Think about my Fitbit. I bid 99 bucks for it. It's changed my health behavior, but I can't charge my insurance company back for it. Shouldn't I be able to? Fantastic. If a marketplace was actually existent, here's what it should look like. This is a picture of sort of the rings of healthcare. In the middle, you see Cure. There's a lot of Cure-based companies out there that are pharmaceutical manufacturers and medical device manufacturers in the entire ecosystem. Then there's Cure around that. I'm in the pharmaceutical industry today. And there's the patent clift and regulatory landscape and all the strains that are happening to this industry. And inside, instead of looking at prevention as an economic platform, they're trying to find more cure-based drugs. Instead of looking at prevention, they're trying to find more cure-based drugs. If this industry existed, we ought to be able to go from pharmaceuticals to prevent the pharmaceuticals. If the industry existed, we should have censoring. When you think about prevention, I, I presume everyone here is vaccinated, right? Anyone who's not vaccinated? The first forms of prevention was vaccination. Today, we have sensors that we implant in human beings after we have identified that they're sick so that we can listen for deterioration. Why not use things like 23andMe and the rest of technologies out there to get a predisposition of a young child and then censor them early as modern vaccination so that we can listen forward for deterioration? A vibrant prevention industry would have censoring. It wouldn't be reactive, it would be proactive. A vibrant prevention industry would have the ability to have specialized medicine. Anybody take um, allergy drugs? Okay, I take Allegra. I mean, there's contestability in the therapeutic class, but it's the one that, you know, I like the color, I guess. It's the same color as the Constellation logo. <coughs> and, you know, I know so much about my body, but I still take broad spectrum drugs, although we've gone past the stage of broad spectrum measurement. One of the reasons why broad spectrum drugs still work is because at one point, you could only do broad spectrum measurement. Now we can measure our bodies to a significantly narrow space. Regardless of how much pollen there was that day, how much I'm sneezing, my body's metabolism, the only thing I can get is about 80 milligrams or 160 milligrams, I think, of, of the pill. Some days I know that I should take a rasp iron and just file the pill down because I don't need 80. I really need 73. 
That's what a prevention industry should look like. Now, we've got this progress. We don't have this, and we are heading here. Gentlemen, the clicker is not working. Who do you think these people are? You guys kind of saw it earlier. These are hypochondriacs, my friends. These are hypochondriacs. These are people that are using the information to create added strain on the already strained medical system because we're giving them information that is not useful for them. It's not creating the type of outcome that we would want. It's not creating the type of experiences that we would want. They're running to doctors because they think they've self-diagnosed. We're at a point now where most medical doctors have to undiagnose people, and the doctor's opinion becomes the first, second opinion. And that's because we're going about it in a completely wrong way. We're still thinking about products. We're not thinking about an ecosystem. We're still thinking about a platform. We're not thinking about an industry. We have to be able to create the rules of engagement. We have to go in a completely opposite direction if we wanted to get away from the current path that we're on. Here's the path that we're on. There's a couple of apps fighting for your health attention. Here's the path that we should be on. Gentlemen, you got to help me here. The clicker is not working. OK. I'll try the clicker. Bear with me, folks. It's not my first time on the rodeo, but this horse is rogue. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll just stand behind here and do this. This is the trajectory that we're on. And we need to be moving in a completely opposite direction. Here's what I mean by that. First, we need to get the providers in. Second, we need to start thinking about your care circle and your health information systems. Next, we need the patient personalization. We need identity. We need privacy. We need a clinical computing cloud to be able to look at this data in a, in a, in a very cognitive computing mindset but in self, a self-healing way at the, same t at the same point. What we know about health data about our bodies is that it's not perfect. Okay, my Fitbit ran out of battery last night. I don't want my health system to start notifying me because I think I haven't been walking for five hours. Okay, well, you need to be able to put the type of computing here that heals the information by itself. Then, when we find the machine level signals that are on the margin of certainty, that we think are the right types of notifications that can create the type of behavioral change that will enact prevention, we need to take that to a human knowledge cloud. And your insurance company needs to be able to make a microscopic payment to be able to have a doctor or a med school student review that and give you some sort of human interpretation of it, because we're not going to be able to take the human element out of the entire stack. Okay? Then we need behavior and ethics. Prevention is a lot more about behavior and ethics than it is about biology and chemistry. The message is extremely important. We need to think about liability and the economics. The regulators need to be able to approve the types of messages that will not create hypochondriacs. There's a targeting process here. There's a clinical trial process here to figure out how a prevention industry works. We need security and compliance. We need to think about engagement and gaming. Too bad Jane's not here today. I'd like her on my board of advisors. This picture that you see is what I mean when I say we have to go in the complete opposite direction. Because the direction that we're on today looks like this. Hypochondria only feeds the cure-based system that we have today. We have to deliberately go out and force this thing into existence by pulling the bodies together. It's not going to make itself. Let me tell you what this looks like. Don't try to read the great text. I call it awesome sauce. It says something like this. 
Richie, in the last 90 days, after listening to four KPIs on your body, we've noticed that your likelihood of getting a heart attack before you hit 50 just increased by 5%. And if you go see any of the three doctors within the next 60 days, and you take the following four tests, here's a coupon code. Not only do we waive your copay, we give you a rebate back for 100 bucks after you've taken the test. And if you comply to what we recommend for you, we'll take 10% off of your insurance policy for the next year because we believe that you can actually reverse that. Now, there's a lot more that goes with that. There is, uh, you know, what are the types of alternative medicine? I mean, all types of interesting things could happen there. This is significantly different from the trajectory we're on today. This is what I call awesome sauce. The reason why I'm here is because obviously, I'm yet solving another puzzle. Over the next year, I've got a goal of, de of delivering five things in a stretch goal. The first thing I'm going to deliver in the human API is a dictionary slash lexicon that we will use to discuss prevention over. The medical literature is confusing enough, okay? So first thing we're going to do is pull the, the language together so we can describe it properly, the rules of engagement, how the various entities operate. The second is I'm pulling together a list of visionaries to form working groups to be able to start to articulate how it will actually work. The third is I'm starting to build the first versions of a marketplace of potential buyers, potential sellers, and experts in the area so that we can create the equivalent of a pharmacy for prevention. The fourth is a reference architecture, which will be a blown out uh, model of the diagram that you saw that describes where and how and what and why and what's needed. And the last thing are proof of concepts up and down that stack. And we've got some work going on in neurology with Ohio State University. You can help. And you can help by introducing us to folks, by amplifying the message, by storifying the message, and by advocating for the fact that if we don't do this for mankind, it's not going to create itself. My name is Richard Tuaru. That's my co-founder, Michael De Palma. Thank you very much.